hominins would have hunted in about groups of perhaps 50. Actually, he calculates that the maximum group size would be about 150. Uh, Robin Dunbar comes from Magdalen College, Oxford, which is about the number of fellows of that college, so perhaps that's the reason. <laughs> Anyhow, whatever, whatever the reason for that, um, this doubling of brain size is an extraordinary event in evolutionary history. And so I propose to you a thought that's occurred to me, which I've not actually had challenged by anybody, but maybe I'm wrong about this. But if you think about it, we are probably the only species that has actually manipulated its own evolution. Because by the development of this technology, we changed our evolution. And the interesting thing, of course, is that now, with the kind of technology we have in laboratories like mine, making large animal transgenics, large mammals transgenic, the possibility is we could modify our own evolution again. It's a threatening and interesting idea. Now, there's another aspect, of course, to this. There's a third cranium on the photograph, but actually the modern human brain is about 14, 50 millilitres. So it's been a tripling of size in about 3.9 million years from Australopithecus. And um, the interesting question... Oh, by the way, um, it's average for 1,450 millilitres. Women have a brain which, on average, is about 70 millilitres less than males. And just in case you men are thinking how clever you are, let me just remind you the reason why your brain is slightly bigger is because we males are not prepared to ask questions where we're going. <laughs> if we draw a timeline across this photograph, which incidentally is taken where mankind is thought to have started, this is in the uh, Rift Valley in Kenya, uh, you can see um, uh, that, let's say this represents Homo sapiens, his lifespan, 100,000 years. I mean, we can argue about whether Homo sapiens has been on Earth 150,000 or 60,000 years. I don't think that matters. And my timeline is extraordinarily crude. I haven't measured it. But if we draw another timeline, which is that tiny little dot at the top left-hand corner of your screen as you look, that represents about 400 years. That's extraordinary if you think about it, because in the last 400 years, in, let's say, 1599, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. Um, since then, we've invented the telescope, the spinning jenny, the steam engine. We've built computers. We've landed on the moon. And at the present time, of course, we're now thinking about synthetic biology. And many of you will be aware that it's very likely that Craig Venter next year, or this year maybe even, will announce that he's finally got his mycoplasma mycoplasma to actually work as a synthetic organism with the re reassembling of its genome inside the yeast that he's been publishing. I, I think the paper was in Nature about six months ago. It, interestingly, that particular organism that he grew or he made in the laboratory didn't grow, didn't replicate, didn't reproduce, didn't use energy, so it was effectively dead, but that I don't think will be something which will be continuing indefinitely. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that in 1599, Shakespeare could have leant over London Bridge and looked at the scenery on the South Bank and said, this is not going to change in my lifetime. Actually, he would have been wrong because the theatre that Burbage built, the Globe Theatre, burnt down in, I think, um, about 16 years later after Hamlet was published. But nonetheless, the scenery, actually, of London didn't change. But now, if we stand on modern London Bridge, we couldn't possibly say that our intellectual scenery would not change radically in the next five years. In fact, we can't predict where we're going as a species. That is, I think, extraordinarily interesting. So there's a built-in uncertainty into everything we do. And if you like it, this list of some of the technologies we have developed or are developing, are both a massive promise, so, so huge opportunity. I don't think any of us probably in this room would not rather live in 2010 than 1910 or 1810 or 1610 because I think the evidence is that we are steadily living longer, more healthy lives and generally more fulfilled ones and probably happier as well. 
But there's also a threat implied in this because, of course, as technology burgeons, we become more and more concerned about it. And the thing I want to propose to you is that every piece of technology we produce has both a promise and a threat. And the downside of technology is not usually recognized or talked about at the time of its invention. Now, I've got interested in this partly because of my work in, uh, um, in, as chairman of the Select Committee for Science and Technology in the House of Lords, which, which I was, I'm not no longer chairman, but when I was chairman, we had a whole range of inquiries, top of which actually was nuclear waste disposal. But at that time, uh, 12 years ago, we were interested in the fact that there were a number of debacles in science. First of all, it seemed that there was mistrust over how we should handle, handle nuclear waste. And it's very interesting that the committee I chaired made very strong recommendations to the government, which were unanimous from a number of people, many of whom were fellows of the Royal Society or captains of industry. Very clear indications of what we should do, which even now the government have not implemented. Um, that I think is interesting. Then there is the, the huge debate over global, global warming, whether scientists are to be trusted or not. We wasted masses of money on BSE and CJD, about three billion on our failure to deal with foot and mouth disease in a scientifically effective manner. The issue of GM crops, I suggest to you, was a debacle. I would be very interested to hear what David Bellamy may say about this. But in my view, uh, GM crops probably do have a place in uh, human ecology, used wisely and with a technology it, which is given to the people who need to use it for their own benefit and not controlled by big industry. But of course, there at least should be a debate about this. And at least the country which does that work should be able to be able to do the research to gain the knowledge without the need for people simply laying waste crops which are being grown. To my mind, that is not responsible. We had the debate about cloning humans. I've mentioned MMR vaccine. We have a real issue about animal vaccination. I suspect uh, animal experimentation. I suspect most of you in this room are wearing some form of leather or eat meat. And it seems extraordinary to me to consider that we might end up banning animal experimentation when in fact we treat animals remarkably cruelly by farming them and how much more useful it will be to save lives. Any of us who take drugs probably should have on that drug packet like a cigarette packet, not that this uh, drug kills, but this drug has been made possible and safe by the use of animal experimentations because that is actually almost universally true. And we have the current issue about nuclear power and how it should be used, if at all, in our armamentarium. My own view is that nuclear power would be extremely useful, but the 60s technology which we've been using is one that is out of date, and it worries me very much that we are not able to do the research in that area. For example, I think Imperial College is the only university, you know, the university where I'm at, which actually has its own uh, experimental nuclear power station. And the fact is we cannot get students to work in nuclear fission because it's so unpopular. And uh, in fact, I don't know what we do about decommissioning our own nuclear power station. Probably too expensive to do that, so it'll just sit there and rot. Only, I think, in the field of embryonic stem cells have we made significant progress. Uh, and that's interesting.